Well, good morning, and thank you for joining the 2018 Illinois Family Institute Worldview Conference. I'm Monty Larrick. Well, about our conference leader, as president of the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, John Stone Street's passion is to illuminate a biblical worldview for today's culture. His breakpoint commentaries are heard on over 1,200 radio affiliates. John has co-authored several books, including A Practical Guide to Culture, Helping the Next Generation Navigate Today's World. John and his wife, Sarah, have three daughters and live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He knows about the consequences of marijuana in Colorado. Uh, his session one topic, the Imago Day the beautiful, beautiful biblical vision of the human person. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Stone Street. Thank you. All right, we have that. I think I'm on here. Am I on? Can you guys hear me okay? Good morning. Thank you for that warm uh, introduction and that warm welcome, I've got to say. Of all the welcomes I've ever had, that one is by far the most recent. So thank you for that. <laughs> I uh, need to do two friendly amendments. Uh, hopefully this thing will pop up, there we go. I need to do two friendly amendments to that introduction. Uh, number one is uh, since that introduction or since that bio was written, uh, the Colson Center has become a independent organization over the last three years, one of the two legacy organizations of the late great Chuck Colson, so I'm now the president, uh, which is kind of fun. We've had a great time. I tried to go for the title of czar, but they didn't let me take that one. <laughs> Uh, and uh, secondly, you mentioned I have three daughters, which I, is true, but these three daughters, who are 12, 10, and 8, uh, uh, conspired, I think the word is colluded, together for uh, five years uh, for a little brother. And they prayed to God, and against our will, they won. So we now have a little boy to add to that mix, who will be who will be a year old uh, this week. So it's a lot of fun to have a little boy. I think it's okay though. I hear having, you know, we already have the, the tough ones. I hear having girls is a lot harder than having boys. I don't know if that's true. Uh, because if you have a boy, you just gotta worry about one boy. If you have a girl, you gotta worry about all the boys in the world. So, um, and so I, I think we're okay. Well, listen, I wanna jump right in because we're a little behind. I wanna make sure we stay on schedule as much as possible, which is something that I often promise and rarely deliver. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to offer right off the bat a, um, a, a framework for understanding almost all the issues in our culture. And, uh, and I say almost all, but, but I, I mean it. It's almost all. And, and, and here's what I mean by that. In our book, A Practical Guide to Culture, we talk about a whole lot of issues in culture. We go issue by issue. So you'll find a section in there that deal with what we call the cultural waves, uh, if you've ever been at a beach and you got hit by a wave, you know it, right? You got hit by it, you feel it. There's a lot of those these days, right? Whether we're talking about uh, the L, the G, the B, the T, whether we're talking about um, the opioid epidemic and the new kind of drug-addicted culture that we have, whether we're talking about the racial uh, uh, uprisings and the racial tension that we have, these are issues that we know about and that we feel. But if you've ever been at the beach, and you've jumped into the, to the ocean and, um, and suddenly you, you play, you're playing in the water for a couple minutes and then you find yourself 20, 30 yards down the beach. Has that ever happened to anyone here? Yeah, you didn't feel it. It wasn't a wave, it was a what? It was a current. We call them undercurrents in, in, in our book. And there's a number of undercurrents. And this undercurrent, uh, and I'm not gonna deal with all of them, you can look at the book. We identify four in that book, but I wanna talk about one of them. And that's this issue of what it means to be human. To really understand almost every issue that takes place in culture, this is a framework. Hopefully that'll be helpful. Uh, as you know, uh, many of you know, my uh, co-author, or sorry, my co-host Eric Metaxas and I have continued on the courageous uh, and the great work of the late Chuck Colson and Breakpoint every single day. Breakpoint is a commentary that deals with cultural issues from a Christian worldview. Uh, Chuck talked about this years ago. Uh, it started this years ago and we've continued it. If you listen to Breakpoint and you want a window into how we cover the stories we cover, this is gonna be one of those windows as well, uh, which is uh, this issue about what it means to be human. Let me introduce it this way. I know there's um, very little evidence uh, of it at this point in my life, but at one time I was an athlete and um, that wasn't funny. And I, 
played, I played basketball, so I still like to watch basketball. I really like college basketball, but I still kind of pay attention to the NBA. A couple years ago, there was a story uh, from the NBA that made national and international news. It was when a man named Jason Collins, who was uh, uh, an active NBA player, announced that he was a gay man in the pages of Sports Illustrated. Do you remember this story? Uh, on the cover, the title was, I'm black, I'm gay, and I'm in the NBA. Now, why that was a big deal was he was the first male athlete in what's called one of the major U.S. team sports, uh, ba baseball, football, basketball. He was, one of the, he was the first active male athlete in one of those biggies uh, to announce that he was a gay man. And he did it in the pages of Sports Illustrated. And so it got a lot of press. And uh, it, it, it was interesting. I, I remember going back uh, to my hotel room when I, I was traveling, when that announcement came out, I turned on ESPN. I wanted to see how they were talking about it. And it, it's pretty typical when someone makes an announcement like this. Uh, what you hear is things like this. See if you can fill in the blank. Finally, he can just, what? Be himself. He no longer has to hide, what? Who he is, right? Uh, interestingly enough, a year later, I was down in Australia, the top male athlete in that country, a swimmer, made the same announcement, same sort of language. He doesn't have to hide who he is. He can just be himself. And it was interesting because another interesting factor is in that article, he not only announced that he was a gay man, he announced that he was a Christian. And because he believed that Jesus uh, was about love and tolerance and acceptance, that he was able to reconcile his Christianity and his gay lifestyle. Well, I was watching the television, particularly a show called Outside the Lines on ESPN, and they had a uh, commentator on there who's one of my favorite basketball commentators, a guy named Chris Broussard. And Chris is known as really know the game of basketball, and he's also a believer. So they were asking him questions about um, uh, this announcement. Will this change the NBA? Will this mean that more players will come out as gay or lesbian? Uh, would this mean that, um, you know, would this mean that Jason Collins won't get signed? How will this affect the NBA? Uh, and these are legitimate questions that have to do with the sport. And then they asked him this question. The announcer said, hey, Chris, you're a Christian too, right? And Chris said, yeah. He said, well, what do you think, not only about his announcement that he's gay, but that he's a Christian? Do you think it's okay to be gay and a Christian? And all God's people said, awkward. I mean, how do, you, how do you answer that question on national television? Well, Chris said, well, as a Christian, I believe God created sex to be in the context of marriage between a man and a woman. Anything outside of that, heterosexual, homosexual, would be a sin. How do you think that went over? I mean, they called for his firing. They called for his head on a platter. Uh, they accused him of hating Jason Collins, which is really funny because if you actually look at the language, I think he condemned the sexual behavior of the entire NBA with that statement, not just, you know, Jason Collins. But in, in, anyway, um, what he was told when he expressed his opinion, even though he was asked for it, was you have to keep those views, what? To yourself. And he said, John, what does this have to do with what you're talking about? I want to point you to an article that I would encourage you to look up uh, online. I think it's the most important article written about this trend, this undercurrent that I'm about to talk to you about that I've seen. It was written in 2013. It's called uh, Sex After Christianity by Rod Dreher. Now, if you're Googling that, please Google carefully. Can we just say that? Google carefully. If you're a minor, don't Google. Ask your parents, okay? But Sex After Christianity was an article in which Rod Dreher it describes something that he called the cosmological shift. What did he mean by the cosmological shift? Let me give you the punchline. Ready? That the most significant changes that have happened in American society have not been fundamentally moral slides. Now, follow me on this, because there certainly have been moral slides. There have been things that were once considered wrong that are now considered right. And there are things that were once considered right that are now considered wrong. I'm not saying those moral slides don't exist. I'm saying that to understand those moral slides, you have to understand that those are the fruit, not the root. That that's the effect, not the cause. That the most significant thing that's changed in our culture has not been a shift about morality, it's been a much deeper shift. He calls it cosmology. Now that's not cosmetology, that's different. 
Cosmology is our very fundamental view of reality itself. What kind of world we think we live in. And I'm going to make it just a little bit more specific from cosmology because I think the most significant shift we've had in our society, I mean largely the West, specifically America, has not been a moral slide, but it's been a cosmological one, specifically, ready? And I apologize for these really big words. Anthropology. We've had a big shift in what it means to be human. And that Jason Collins story is an evidence of that right in front of us. Follow me. The history of Western civilization is diverse and it's complicated. But one of the things that it shares in common is that there was a view of what it means to be human. And even though the influences that shape Western civilization, the Judeo-Christian influences, the Greco-Roman influences, the, the, the secular humanist influences, Enlightenment influences, they differed on all kinds of beliefs. What they agreed on is that what it means to be human is to be a fundamentally metaphysical creature. Now that's a big way of saying that what it means to be human is to be the sort of creature that asks those big questions about life in the world. We don't just live, we wonder why we live. We don't just eat, we decorate our food, right? We just don't make decisions, we ponder the meaning and the existence of life. We ask questions like, is there a God? Is there truth? How do we know? Who's in charge? What's right and wrong? What happens when we die? What's the end of history? These aren't questions that your animals ask. Your pets don't go around wondering these questions. All your pets care about is where they're going to find their next meal, where they're going to find their next nap, and where they're going to find their next mate. It sounds like college students, but real humans, <laughs> real humans ask bigger questions. What's true? What's good? What's right and wrong? And how do we know? And throughout the history of Western civilization, there was that common view of what it means to be human, that we're these sorts of creatures and our behavior is on the side. Doesn't mean we share behavior, because how you answer these questions determines behavior. But the questions came first, the behavior came second. Does that make sense? So throughout the history of Western civilization, what it meant to be human was to be the sort of creatures that wrestle with the meaning and existence of life and to put our behavior on the side. Jason Collins makes a statement about his behavior. He's told that's who he is. Chris Broussard makes a metaphysical observation about right and wrong. He's told you have to keep it to yourself. Do you see the shift? That the most significant thing that's happened in our society has not been a shift in morality. It's been a shift in our understanding of what it means to be human. And the evidence of this is huge. It's a shift that goes back really throughout most of the 20th century. At the end of the 20th century, a 20th century into our century as well. At the end of the 20th century, in 1992, in Time magazine, Henry Grunewald wrote an article, stunning article, called The Year 2000. Here's what he said. He said, one of the most remarkable things about the 20th century, more than technological progress and physical violence. Now, hold on. Do you remember the 20th century? What did it begin with? World War what? And then it went to World War what? And then it went to the... Cold War, and that was fueled by technological progress. What was the story of the 20th century, if not technological progress and physical violence? Here's what he says, the deconstruction of man and woman. And he backs us up and he goes through this whole history. And it's fascinating to read this in Time Magazine. He said that our view of man depends on our view of God. And we've been through this transitional phase. Whereas it used to be that, that we believed in God, but after the scientific revolution of the 18th century, we kind of put God on the side and, and we just made God the sort of cheerleader that cheered on all of our achievements from science and technology. And then there was the 19th century and the most important book written in the 19th century. What was the most important book written in the 19th century? Darwin. Darwin's what? origin of species. And what that did is it gave the world its last needed explanation that no longer required God. And so suddenly you went from God being outside of the creation, just kind of waving us on and clapping for us as we figured out all this kind of cool scientific stuff to God being unnecessary altogether. But what Grunewald said is, is that that gave birth to a century, the 20th century, in which not only did we reject God, but we lost our view of man. Does that make sense? 
He says this, the ultimate irony or perhaps tragedy is that secularism, the view of reality that doesn't need God, has not led to humanism, the elevation of human nature. He says, we've gradually dissolved, deconstructed the human being into a bundle of reflexes, impulses, neuroses, and nerve endings. The great religious heresy used to be making man the measure of all things. We have come close to making man the measure of nothing. How many of you guys have heard this phrase? Ideas have what? consequences. Let me give you chapter two. It's what I just did. Ready? Ideas have histories. Ideas have histories. And what I'm trying to show you is that there's an idea that has this long history that now is bearing consequences. And we can see it reflected in almost every area of culture. Our lack of understanding about what it means to be human. We see it in education. This is what one Duke University student said. We've got no philosophy of what it is that we want by the time somebody graduates. The so-called curriculum is a set of hoops that someone says we students ought to jump through before graduation. Anybody feel like that in college? Like you were just jumping through somebody's hoops, right? And that's really one of the mistakes of education. It's like they have a degree, you have money, you pay them money, they lay out all these hoops, you jump through these hoops, and poof, you're an educated person. What could possibly go wrong with this plan, right? Look at what his last line is. No one seems to have asked, how do people become good people? How do we actually become good people? We're doing education today without an understanding of what it means to be human. Here's another example in popular culture. My friends at a ministry called Axis have something that you need to sign up for. You need to sign up for it now. It's called the Culture Translator. It is a a, a tool that you will get every single week from this great organization that will help you translate all the lingo, all the pop culture trends that are happening in millennial culture. So if you have teenagers or grandchildren and you want to understand the words and the emojis and I mean, everything, this is what they do. They translate youth culture for us old fogies, okay? That's what they do. A couple weeks ago, they had a story about a new trend, and the trend was called the Kylie Jenner Challenge. Now, if you don't know who Kylie Jenner is, she's a, she's a model. She's part of the Kardashian family, the worst thing that ever happened to the world. Uh, I'm just kidding. That's not true. But, but it's, our, you know, kind of the, the celebrities of the moment. But, but she's kind of known for these puffy lips, and... So what she has done is spark this whole challenge of girls trying to get puffy lips for different things. That's called the Kylie Jenner challenge. Um, They use expensive lip plumpers to achieve this. And And it's fascinating because she actually admitted a couple weeks ago why she puffed up her lips. It's because a boyfriend when she was 16 year old, 16 years old, um, said that she was a bad kisser. And so that led her to get lip injections. And then that led a whole challenge in our culture. So why is it that when Kylie Jenner, who really hasn't contributed anything significant to the world yet in her life, except maybe some pictures, why why is it that entire generation of young people follow her? It's an image thing. They think that what it means to be human is what they look like. Does that make sense? So it's again, it's another example that we don't know who we are. But this is the best example that I've seen. This is from Dutch Royal, uh, Royal Dutch Airlines, KLM, Dutch KLM Airlines. They put out a tweet a couple weeks ago, and you can see what it is. It's three sets of seatbelts. Um, they're rainbow, so you know what it's referring to. This was a tweet to celebrate what's called Pride Amsterdam Day, which is a gay pride day in the Netherlands. And I don't know how else to describe this, because this is how you describe these sorts of things uh, when you're describing seatbelts or electrical wiring or all kinds of things. Three pairs of seatbelts, two female ends, two male ends, and a male female end. And they're all rainbow. And the caption is, it doesn't matter who you click with. Think amongst yourselves there for a second. If you want one of the more enjoyable um, 30 minutes of your week, go find this tweet and then just read all the comments underneath it. It's fascinating because people who don't necessarily, I mean, not Christians, are commenting on this going, what? Like one guy said, so what you're saying is KLM Airlines values the safety of their passengers unless they're gay and lesbian? Another guy said, so this week on KLM Airlines, are the flight attendants going to get up and say, just grab whichever two ends you can find of your seatbelt. It doesn't matter who you click with. My favorite was this one guy who wrote, I'm gay, and that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) 
my thought the whole time, I just looked at it and I said, only one of these clicks. Now you say, John, what are you trying to communicate? Here's what I'm trying to communicate, a whole lot of things. This passed the marketing department. Our culture's so lost on what it means to be human. Like, this tweet went through a department of individuals. And somebody was like, love it, pull the trigger. Hit publish. When it obviously, I, mean, I don't know how to say it. it does matter who you, it does matter which end you click, like only one of these clicks. You, you see what I'm saying? Right? So, so this is an example of being so far removed from what it means to be human. We've entered an arena where we're far removed about what is reality. Do, do you understand what I'm saying here? We'll come back to this a, a, a little bit later. Now, what's lost in all of this, T.S. Eliot, and I recommend T.S. Eliot to you, uh, one of the, read him, even though he looked a little bit like Herman Munster. Um, T.S. Eliot said, if we see a new and mysterious machine, I think the first question we ask is, what is that machine for? Afterwards, we ask, how does it do it? This is a brilliant observation. The reason that we've lost what it means to be human is, is that we're basically a culture that asks, what should we do with humans? What should we do with human institutions like marriage? What should we do with human facilities like bathrooms? What should we do with human programs like educational programs? What should we do with humans? And we've stopped asking the question, what are humans for? But if you don't know what something is for, you really don't know what to do with it. Does that make sense? I mean, walk through this here with me. Imagine that I'm, um, you know, come across a laptop. And I, I don't know anything about laptops. I've never seen a laptop computer before. And so I ask myself, what can I do with it? Or what can it do? Oh, it opens and closes. I could have a puppet show. It's flat and smooth. I could skip it across the lake like a rock. Right? Now, I can do those things with my laptop. But when I do those things with my laptop, what happens? In the first case, I'm dramatically underutilizing it. Unless it's a Dell, then it doesn't matter. But I'm dramatically underutilizing it. In the second case, I'm, my action, skipping it across the lake, is actually going to do what? It's going to damage it and destroy it. Before I decide what to do with the laptop, I need to know what a laptop is for. Before we decide what to do with humans, before we decide how to educate them, before we decide how to structure their, their public lives through policy, through bathrooms and everything else, before we decide what it means uh, for, for, to do church with them and to do youth group with them and to parent them, the fundamental question is, what are humans for? Who are they? What were they designed for? Does that make sense? That's the piece that we have lost. Psalm 135 talks about how we lose this. Uh, in Psalm 135, after 14 verses of telling us uh, that we ought to praise God instead of the idols, David then moves on and he says, The idols of the nations are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths but can't speak, eyes but can't see, ears but can't hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Now we know that. We know it's weird and to learn about cultures where they took a block of wood, carved an ear on it, and then started to talk to it. But that's not David's final point. Do you see his final point, verse 18? Those who make them will be what? Like them. God has made us in such a way that we become what we worship. We see ourselves as individuals and as cultures in the image of whatever it is that we worship. And if that's the case, we've lost what humans are for because we've lost an understanding of God. It's an inevitable consequence. A culture that rejects God is a culture that will lose sight of what it means to be human. Are you guys with me so far? Is this making sense? And this is a huge loss. And let's go back to something. Now, this is a, a, a something that was even put in, in our a constitution. This is, when I, when I mean when we've lost what it means to be human, I'm, I'm going to show you how dramatic of a loss this actually is. You know this famous line, right, from the Declaration. We hold these truths to be what? Self-evident that all are created equal. Now, that's, a, that's an idea. Is it self-evident that we're all equal? Look around. Seriously, just take a minute. Look around. Is it self-evident that we're equal? Look around again. 
No, the most self-evident thing is that we're all what? Different. We don't look equal. Some of us are taller than others. Some of us have different colors of skin. Some of us have, have, have different genders. Some of us are male, female. Some of us are older, younger. Some of us are in shape. Some of us are more like me. You know, th there's all kinds of differences. If we are all equal, it can't be based on anything on the outside. It's got to be based on something on the inside. It can't be based on anything self-evident um, uh, uh, visibly or biologically, because there's nothing self-evident biologically. It's got to be based on an idea. And Chuck Colson said that the most significant idea that Christianity ever gave the world, other than, of course, the saving message of Jesus for personal salvation, was this idea that humans are made in the image and the likeness of God. Amen. In fact, you don't find this language. This is revolutionary language. It was so revolutionary that our own founders and our own nation couldn't figure out how to live it out for a couple hundred years. And we still wrestle with it. But it was different in the sense that it was actually there. That there was something about us that gave us equality. Not only that, in fact, in fact um, this whole idea of human equality, you don't get it in human history until you get Christianity giving us the, the idea of the image of God. Uh, don't take my word for it. Take the word of this atheist, Luke Ferry. Luke Ferry uh, was a, uh, is a philosopher at the University of Paris, and he's an atheist. And Luke Ferry wrote a book called A Brief History of Thought, in which he kind of traces the evolution of Western ideas that have made a difference in the world. And he has a chapter in this book on Christianity. Now, we would look at that and go, well, of course, Christianity played a big role in Western civilization. His atheist buddies got really mad at him. And they said, wait, Christianity is a religion, not a philosophy. It doesn't belong in a book of ideas. And he actually admits that he was grumpy for having to put Christianity in his own book. He didn't want to put it there because he's an atheist. He thinks Christianity is wrong, even dangerous in places. But he said he had to put it in. Why? Here's what he said. Christianity was to introduce the notion that humanity was fundamentally identical, that men were equal in dignity, not on the outside, but on the inside, listen to this, an unprecedented idea at the time and one to which our world owes its entire democratic inheritance. Did you catch that? This idea of what it means to be human, Luke Ferry says, is the reason we have an entire democratic inheritance in the first place. And he goes on to say, but this notion of equality didn't come from nowhere. Where did it come from? It came from the idea of the image of God. I was going to give you that C.S. Lewis quote. It was going to change your life, but I'm out of time. So let me, let me, let me push through on this. So, so we've got this very important, significant idea of the image of God. We have a culture of confusion about what it means to be human. How do we kind of bring this together? Here's the problem. The problem is not necessarily that the culture has forgotten God and the culture then has forgotten what it means to be human. That's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is, is if we go to church to church to church today and we stood up and we said, hey, everybody, fill in the blank. Humans are made in the, and everyone would say together, image of God. But then we would say, well, what does that mean? What is the image of God? We'd hear a lot more crickets, wouldn't we? So there's a real theological problem that it's one of the most important ideas the world has ever seen, and many Christians don't know how to articulate why it's important. We don't want to know how to articulate what it actually means to be in the image of God. And so that's what I want to do. I want to spend the last little part of our time here trying to give us a framework for understanding almost every issue in culture and also understanding how we can respond to culture with this kind of hopefully this intellectual grounding in place. Now, there's a couple different ways to talk about or to look at the image of God. I remember growing up in church, sometimes I would hear pastors say, the Bible talks more about this than it does about this. And it was a way to talk about how important something was, right? The Bible talks more about hell than it does about heaven. Or the Bible talks more about money than it does about sex. Or the Bible talks more about this than it does this. As if, you know, that the, the measure of biblical importance is how many references there are in the Bible. Now, if the Bible were more like an encyclopedia, that would be true. But the Bible's not like an encyclopedia. The Bible's like a grand sweeping narrative, a 
big story, capital B, capital S, the, the biggest story of the world. It describes reality as it actually is. And if you just count up the number of references to image of God in the Bible, it's like five or six, depending on what you throw into that, that, that bucket. And there's not that many. And if that's the measure, then it's not very important at all. But in a story, the most important thing about the story is the characters in the story. And so it doesn't matter how many times it's mentioned, it matters the role that it plays in the whole narrative. And the image of God is something that emerges. Our understanding of the image of God emerges in each chapter of the biblical story. So that's what I want to do now is I want to walk through how the Bible talks about humanness, humanity throughout the entire sweeping narrative of the scripture. Now you're like, you're going to do that in the next 10 minutes. Here's the good news. The biblical story can be summed up in four chapters. Some of you have heard this, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Say that with me again. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. These are the four big chapters of the Bible. And each of these chapters reveals something to us about what it means to be human that is unique, that's powerful, and that helps us understand who humans are and why humans, what, what humans are for. Let's start with then the creation chapter. Right. The creation chapter in the beginning. It's important to start with the creation chapter because some of us who would be able to answer that trivia question, humans are made in the image of God, often start our description about who humans are with we're sinners. We jump into the story at Genesis three. But there's still Genesis one and two. You, you see what I'm saying? And the only time we go back to Genesis 1 and 2 is to beat up those darn evolutionists. Now, trust me, I think Darwin's the cause of most of what's wrong with the world. But we need to go to Genesis 1 and 2, not just for what we're against, but also for what we believe. So let's walk through the story. Do you have your Bibles there? Or do you have your smartphones? You can turn in your smartphones to Genesis 1 and 2. It starts here. In the what? Beginning, God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. And the earth, verse 2, and this is often a throwaway verse for us because we fight over the age of the earth, and I think that matters, but it's not a throwaway verse. Genesis 1, 2, and the earth was two things. What was it? It was formless and it was void. Now, if you're God and you have something formless, what are you going to do with it? You're going to form it. And you have something void. What's another word for that? You're going to do what? Fill it. Guess what? That verse tells us what God is going to do through the rest of Genesis chapter 1. Right? What's verse 3? And God said, let there be light. And the darkness, which is emptiness, was filled with what? So God's taking emptiness and he's filling it. But what's the very next thing it says? And God did something with the light. What did he do with it? He separated the light from the darkness and the day from the night. When you start separating something... What is that? You're forming it. Do you see what happens here? God takes the emptiness and he fills it. He takes the formlessness and he forms it. And this is repeated every single day of creation. That the empty darkness, the empty water, the empty expanse, the empty ground is filled with living things. And then he divides these living things into their own what? Kinds. So he fills the emptiness and he forms the formlessness. Does that make sense? Now, what does this tell you about God? What does this actually tell you about the sort of God this is? It's fascinating to me that the Bible doesn't begin with an apologetic. Here are five reasons that God's, God exists, and here's how you know. It just assumes God exists. It assumes God exists as the best explanation for all this fullness and all this diversity and all this form and order that we have in the world. Right? How does God fill and form? What does he use? What is the tool of God's created work? How does he do it? He speaks. What does that say about you if you say it and it happens? Well, it says you're God. But some of you, right, but some of you have this sort of play role in your business or your family. Like you come into a room, kids are crazy, and you're like quiet, and everyone's like. Pfft. And if you're that person, please contact me afterwards. I need advice. I don't know how to do this. It would really help my home. Uh, no, but, but what does that say about you if you say it and the kids obey or you say it and all your employees scatter to do your wishes? What does that say about you? You say you're authority. This is the fundamental theological assumption of the entire biblical story. It's called sovereignty. God's in charge. It's, yeah, it's his world. It ain't yours. 
The world belongs to God. He's so in charge, he's in charge over everything that exists. He's so in charge, he's in charge over whether it exists or not. Everything obeys him. In fact, he's so in charge, nothing obeys him. Right? He speaks to nothing. It's like nothing, be something. And nothing obeys him. I mean, this is sovereignty that we've, and this is where the Bible begins, right? Now, it's really fascinating because who's the first people that are learning this? Who's the first people that are receiving this text? You know, in their, who are the first group of people that are hearing this story? Not living it, that's Adam and Eve, but are receiving it, that are, that are hearing it for the first time. It's the Israelites coming out of Egypt, Right? And this is their story. Now, this is fascinating because they're coming out of Egypt. What were they told in Egypt about God? That, that's right. There wasn't one, that there were many, and that the universe wasn't ordered. The universe was on. Do you see what's happening? This is fascinating. The first thing Israel gets when they come out of Egypt is a new theology, and with that, a new cosmology. This is the God, this is the world. And there's a rhythm, there's a pattern here. And God said, let there be, and it was so. And God said, let there be, and it was so. And God said, let there be, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was what? Good. Now, by the way, Israel's an oral culture, so those are kind of rhetorical devices in Genesis chapter 1 that are holding the text together, that are allowing them to remember it. Repetition helps them remember it. And so you have this formula, this rhythm. And God said, let there be and it was so and it was good. Let there be and it was so and it was good. Day one, day two, day three, all the way to day six. In day six, the language changes. Now, just like repetition is a device to get your attention or to help you stay on track, breaking the reputa re uh, repetition is like a highlight because God doesn't say, let there be Adam and poof, there's a man. God says, let us make, make man in our image after our likeness. The language changes. Do you see that? Now, that's when we get this idea of the image of God. It's Genesis 1, 26 through 28. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Now, there are three big theories here. Okay? The first theory is what we might call the functional theory, which is humans are in the image of God because they do the sorts of things that God does. So God creates, humans create. God is rational, humans are rational. I think our abilities to mirror God and his abilities are, are examples or illustrations of the image of God. But if you lose those abilities, do you lose the image of God? Did you, did you follow that question? Right, if I'm in a persistent vegetative state or a coma, right, and I can't create or I can't reason, does that mean I'm not in the image of God and no longer valuable? No. So that's an example of why we can, but I don't think it's a good explanation of what the image of God is. Karl Barth and some other pastors, uh, uh, some other theologians have emphasized the relational aspect of the image of God. The first one's the functional one. The second one is the relational one. The relational one is, is that we're in the image of God, the Trinity. And so we're relational like God, the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, right? When God creates humans, he says, not let me, he says, let what? Us, right? So that's probably a reference there to the Trinity. The third theory, and this is the one that I want to advocate, not that the other two aren't true, I just think they're not complete, is what we would call, what I would call the status theory. It, it, it's, it's the one that tells us the sort of role that we play in the world, what humans are for. Does anybody have that text, by the way, in front of them, Genesis chapter 1? Anybody looking at it? I told you to go there. Are you reading it? Thank you for doing, being a good person. Do you have a loud voice? Can you sound a little bit like God? I mean, we got to sound a little bit like God because we're reading Genesis 1.26. Can you do that? That's not very convincing. All right. We'll give him a shot. There we go. Genesis 1.26. 1.26, and just keep reading until I stop you, okay? Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over us. Okay, read that again. Then God said... Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish. Okay, do that again. <laughs> right. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the Okay, one more time. Hey, by the way, the verse divisions aren't actually there in the text. Does that make sense? And so separating 26 from 27 is going to make us miss something. 
So that's why I'm reading it together. So read it one more time. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the... And let them what? Rule, rule. over the fish what? of the sea. Yeah, hold on. Let, let, let them rule. What did we start with about God? What's the fundamental theological assumption of the entire biblical narrative? That God is what? He's the ruler. Listen, we've read this so much we're bored with it. But this is the first jaw-dropping moment of the scripture. Well, actually, light coming into darkness probably is. This is one of the early ones. Who are the first people that are hearing this text? The Israelites. God already gave them a new theology. Then God gave them a new what? Cosmology. He's now giving them a new anthropology. They learned in Egypt that there were many gods. God said, no, there's just one. They learned in Egypt that these gods have basically rule the world in a chaotic sort of selfish way, and there's not order. God actually changes the view on that. What did they learn about themselves in Egypt? What were they in Egypt for 400 years? They were slaves. God just told slaves that they're rulers. That their role, what are they for? To rule. Keep going. Let them rule over... Over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Over the livestock, over all the earth. And over all the creatures that move along the ground. That's a beautiful poetic way of saying you're in charge of everything. This wasn't a complete list. This was basically God taking the keys to the Corvette and throwing them to the 16-year-old. What could possibly go wrong with this plan? It's yours, buddy. Take care of it. Right? This is what's happening here. God is actually putting his people in charge. This is something we often miss. Now, they're not in charge like autonomously, self-law. They're God's representatives. They're to rule God's world in God's place for God's glory. This is what humans are for. Humans play the most significant role in the, human, in, in, in the creation story other than God himself. This is a big deal. Don't jump to the fall without realizing how big of a deal the creation is. It's huge. Go ahead, keep going. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, let me just say this really quickly, because there's been, in our wrestling with what it means to be made in the image of God, and in our gut-level reaction to what I would call second and third-wave feminism, first-wave feminism actually had some really important corrections for America. Second-wave feminism is when it went off the rails. Third-wave feminism got hijacked, somewhere between the second and third wave, it got hijacked by the sexual revolution, which I'm going to talk about at theoretically in the next session. And this is, it just, it's, it got crazy, okay? But in our reaction, I've heard some really crazy things. Like that women aren't really in the image of God, men are. And that women aren't fully in the image of God until they're married. And that the highest calling of woman is to be a wife and a mom. Now the highest calling of woman is to glorify God as the highest calling of man is to glorify God and to do it at each and every station of their life. And there's a, something brilliant and beautiful and awesome about marriage that they can actually do it together in a new way than they can do it apart. But before we know Eve's name, the scripture tells us that women are in the image of God. Amen? This is a huge truth. It's beautiful. Okay, verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Wait a minute. What was the problem in Genesis 1-2? The earth was formless and it was void. What did God do for five and a half days? He formed it and he filled it and he did it as the ruler. And then he takes the keys, throws them to, to humans who are made in his image. Do you hear what he just told them to do? To be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Now, there's two ways to subdue something. One is like how you subdue a cockroach. How do you subdue a cockroach? And the goal is death to cockroach. That's not how you subdue a garden. Okay, it's not how you're supposed to subdue a garden. You don't squash it and kill it. You cultivate it and what? And you give it life. That's what this word is. Do you understand? 
So basically, God takes a formless and an empty place. He forms it and he fills it as the great sovereign ruler. He then creates other rulers to rule in his place. And he tells them to fill it and to form it, or I like the better word, farm it. Do you see what happens here? Humans are to actually make something of the world. We're supposed to actually make the world bigger and better. We're to continue God's creative work. In fact, it's fascinating when you actually go into the text because God puts Adam and Eve in the garden, but he tells them not to stay in the garden. He says, go, you know, be fruitful, multiply, fill the garden and to do it. No, fill the what? Earth. The curse is not them getting kicked out of the garden. The curse is them being prevented from ever coming back into the garden. They were supposed to take the earth and turn it into a garden. So that's the created truth. You know what that means? That means that every single human being is made in the image and likeness of God. That means that every single human being has dignity and value. And when you deny this chapter and you say that there's not a creation or that we're not created in the image of God or there's not a God so there's no God for us to be in the image of or that God's just a personal private belief, not really a public truth about reality or the world, then what happens is we untether human dignity from the only thing that has ever grounded it. And any time you untether human dignity from the image of God, what happens is some people get left out. And that's the history of the world, people being left out. Now, the second chapter of the story, oh man, that was really good. I'm out of time. I got to keep going. The second chapter of the story is the fall chapter. Now, the fall chapter is this. You're not okay, and I'm not okay. The world is a fallen place. And, and the punchline here, and I'm going to move through this last stuff here pretty quickly and we'll adjust the schedule if that's okay, since we got started just about five minutes late. And I'm already five minutes late. Okay, so the fall, the fall chapter is essentially this. Every worldview assumes that something's wrong with the world, right? That's one of the ways to figure out what somebody believes, what's wrong with the world. Is the problem with the world that race? Is the problem with the world that gender? Is the problem with the world those people? Is the problem with the world that political party? Is the problem with the world, you know, carbon emissions, right? Everybody has a theory about what's wrong with the world. The Christian answer, well, what's wrong with the world is, the ones who were put in charge are the problem with the world. Now, this is huge because most worldviews say the problem's out there. Too many Christians say the problem's out there. G.K. Chesterton was, um, answered an editorial request that a British newspaper put out. Uh, what's wrong with the world? Uh, was the question. And they invited answers to that question, what's wrong with the world? Thousands of answers came in. G.K. Chesterton's answer was this. Dear sirs, in regards to your question, what's wrong with the world? I am, yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> That's really close, right? And that human fallenness, human fallenness actually then is, expresses itself both individually, where sometimes our best intentions go wrong. Anybody had that happen with an email? Right? And it also takes place structurally, where human evil can actually embed itself structurally across cultures and create things like racism and create things like uh, uh, addiction uh, to, to, to lust and, a, you know, a, a culture wide epidemic of addiction. Right. So the, the problem with the world is actually human. Now, what happens if we deny that there is a God who created the world that we're in his image? And so therefore, we're not really fallen from anyone because there's no real moral standards for us to live with. Here's what happens is you have a world that falls prey to utopian fantasies. Utopian fantasies are fantasies of worldviews that say we can fix the world. That if we just do this, it'll solve all of our problems. Right. You don't have to look back in political lingo very far to see a whole bunch of utopian fantasies. And you don't have to look to the left, although they're there. You don't have to look to the right. They're there, too. Just look. They're there. One of the more recent ones that I saw was in the Obergefell decision, the decision that came from the Supreme Court mandating same sex marriage on America. Now, I agree with Justice John Roberts. John Roberts said, if you're for same sex marriage today, then celebrate. But if you do, don't celebrate the Constitution because this decision had nothing to do with the Constitution. And he was right. If you look at the decision, it had nothing to do with the Constitution. 
what uh, Justice Kennedy argued was essentially this utopian fantasy. It's what we call moral evolution. The reason we need same-sex marriage, he said, is because we're a more moral people. We're more, we're more tolerant. We're more just. We're more loving and caring than those who have gone before us. We know better, essentially. And that's what happens in an age of the fall. It's what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, in that everything newer is necessarily better, that we're actually doing it better than those who have gone before us. Let me give you two, two illustrations why chronological snobbery is such a foolish thing. First of all, it wasn't months after Justice Kennedy wrote how much more moral and tolerant and good we were than our forebears that we saw the first, the second, the third, now 11 videos from the Center for Medical Progress describing what happens in selling body parts behind closed doors at Planned Parenthood clinics. And really, we're more moral. At the end of the 19th century, the end of the 1800s, when Darwin has just been firmly implanted in the intellectual uh, uh, intelligentsia of the day, you can find tons of social scientists, thought leaders, basically predicting that 20, the 20th century would be a utopian century, that it would be a century of peace and prosperity. How'd that work out? No, I'm serious. Marx was a utopianist. I mean, you can go down the line. Anybody here have a good working memory of the 20th century? <laughs> Anybody here ever do those things? I'm, I'm, too, I'm old enough to remember the Cold War, like that was the thing when I was growing up. Uh, but I am too young to have ever done this, but some of you probably did nuclear drills. Did any of you ever do nuclear drills, right? In case of a nuclear attack, get under your desk. Do you know what I'm talking about? Now, see, I'm too young to have ever done that. My, my sisters did it. My parents did it. But what's interesting is, is when I was about nine years old, there was a PBS documentary for kids. And I don't know why they did it or why my parents wa let me watch it. But it was a stick figure. And it was what to do in case of a nuclear attack. And it was first, first there will be a really bright light that will blind you. And the little stick figure is like, ah. And then all the skin will melt off your body and you'll die. And so the stick figure just collapses. So get under your desk. <laughs> Third chapter, redemption. Redemption. I'm going to hit this really fast. Third chapter, redemption. Redemption, if you're taking notes, you can write exchange. Exchange. What do you mean? Well, that's the exchange. It's the best deal you'll ever get. Christ says, I will give you my righteousness and I'll take your fallenness. I will give you my adoption as a son of God and I will take your enmity with God you know, on me. That's the exchange. But here's what happens. Scripture is really clear. If you don't take that exchange, you'll take another exchange. And that is exchanging truth for a lie. Right? Now, there's tons of great things to say here. One of those is a theological one, and I'm, I'm tempted to skip it, but it's just so important. When we talk about redemption and what that says about humanity in the biblical story, I'm going to make a statement. Some of you are going to think I'm a heretic, and I'm going to prove that I'm not a heretic. Humans are so important. Humans are the central figure in the biblical story. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, that's heresy because God's the central figure. Yeah, but at the center of the story, John chapter 1 says, is the God who became what? Flesh. This is a really important thing that the early church wanted us to avoid, Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the idea that Jesus only looked like God, he could, or only looked like human. He couldn't really be human because to be human is to be physical and the physical is bad and humans aren't really, and, and, and that's what's wrong with the world is the physical world. And the early church said, no, 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 that's a heresy. Jesus didn't just look like a human. Jesus had a belly button and a spleen. They didn't say that, but they didn't know about spleens. But Jesus had armpits. Jesus had, and he lived before deodorant. Like Jesus was really human. No, this really matters. And, 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 and the early church and the Apostle Paul especially wants you to know that Jesus was fully human because Jesus does what Adam failed to do. Jesus is the second Adam. The first Adam breaks the world. The second Adam fixes the world. Like, so humans are the center of the biblical story because at the climax, the crux of the story, you have the God who became human, who had skin, who had armpits, who had 
you know, hair, who had noses and eyes and like, well, no one knows, and eyes. He was fully human. And this is really important because Gnosticism continues to pop up in the church. The idea that some jobs are Christian jobs and some jobs are secular jobs. That some people are called to the ministry and others aren't. Right? The idea that the most important thing that we do on a daily basis is the spiritual stuff, come to church and so on. One of the great ways, one of the great things about holding this story together is that we get to realize something that's really important. Ready? That what Christ is doing in redemption is not different than what God was intending in creation. Do you see how the story comes? That's why we use the word redemption. And the next chapter is restoration. Rewords. Rewords always point us where? Back. Return. Renew. Restore. Redeem. Reconcile. Uh, resurrection. These Repentance even. These are all rewords that send us back. They make us look back into the story. Here's what's great about that, right? Because what we have is a culture that has forgotten what it means to be human. What we have is a savior that is restoring our humanness. And we have the best answer on the market to this question about what it means to be human. So, Christians need to get better at this. Like, we're like saying, don't do this and don't do that and don't do that. And sometimes the most loving thing we can do, as William F. Buckley said, is stand athwart history and yell stop. But one of the great things Christians can do is, as, as Chuck Holson said in his very last speech, I watched him collapse in front of me. I was sitting on the stage, I watched him collapse and he went to the hospital and he died about a month later. That's how Chuck Colson passed away. We say we, he died with his boots on. Like he was still pouring it on. And one of the things he was saying is Christians don't impose. They propose. Christians have a better answer. Christians have a better vision of reality. And I'll tell you this. Christians have a much better answer to the question what it means to be human than anything else on the market. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to give you one quote. It's my favorite quote. There's sometimes there's quotes that make your heart sing, that capture your imagination. Anybody else here a quote person? Okay, you're not going to have time to write this down, but I'm going to solve that problem for you later. So don't try to write it down. Just listen. Ready? Thomas Howard says this. The incarnation takes all that properly belongs to our humanity and delivers it back to us redeemed. All the inclinations, all the abilities, all the proclivities that belong to us and that have been stolen away into the service of false gods are returned to us in the gospel. He did not come to thin out human life. He came to set it free. What if that's true? What if the best thing you can give to the world is your redeemed humanness. What if Christ didn't come to save you from being human? He didn't come to save you from your passion, from your conviction, from your ability. He came to save you from your fallenness. He doesn't want to take away your humanness. He wants to take it back from those false gods and restore it so that they're used for the glory of Christ Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. Amen.